Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much and I'm so delighted you've joined me for a story tonight. We're on part two of our story and it's a very interesting and very exciting story so I'm so glad you've joined me. And what we've discovered so far is that this young lady is realising that she has got a stalker. Someone has been watching her childhood home that she's moved into and she doesn't want to tell her husband about this stalker but she's observed the stalker watching her from beneath a hoodie and it's freaking her out because she knows something's going on and she's been receiving terribly nasty notes in the post that once again her husband doesn't know about. So her husband thinks that the childhood home that she's living in which has got some nasty memories from the past because she didn't exactly have a great relationship with her mother is what is actually haunting her when in actual fact what really is bothering her is that someone is stalking her. So let's continue with part two of our story. Sometimes I would get flashbacks of my mother haunting me in the daylight hours at Silver Lakes like a real ghost even though she was long since dead but it felt as if she was still around. In my mind's eye, I could vividly see her wide eyes glaring at me contemptuously as she told me that I looked like a tart when I was spending time with girlfriends on an evening. Have you got no shame, girl? She would say. That skirt of yours is far too short. It barely covers your knees. If your father were to see you now, he would be appalled. Why can't you have the grace to cover yourself up? Have some dignity, girl. You're an embarrassment and a disgrace. Go to your room at once and get those filthy things off you at once. Please, Mum, don't be like this. This is a really cool skirt. I bought it with my pocket money. I really want to wear it this evening. I'm your mother. I will not allow you to leave this house under any circumstances looking like a hooker that's standing on a street corner touting for business. What kind of a mother would I be if I allowed you to dress like a hussy? I remember the disgusted, revulsed way my mother had looked at me that evening with a fierce disapproval. But my arrogant mother was the kind of person who believed every body part should be modestly covered up and nothing should ever be on display. That is, if you had any self-respect at all. And after my dad's death, she had become very austere with her stringent rules. But, ma'am, don't you understand? This is the fashion at the moment. Everybody's wearing short skirts like this, I had said, to no avail, of course. I don't care what everybody else is doing, or what everybody else you say is wearing. I care what you're doing, Olivia. And the way you dress is sending out the wrong messages to men. That skirt makes you look decidedly cheap. You should have a good, long, hard look at yourself in the mirror, dear. You don't look at all good. Mum, the skirt isn't that short, I protested. Some of the girls wear them so short that when they bend down, you can actually see their knickers. I don't do that. My skirt is dignified, Mum. It's above my knees. What's wrong with that? Do not answer me back, Olivia. I am your mother. You don't cross-examine me. It's the other way round. What I say always goes. Do you want to go to the party or not? My mother snapped at me furiously. Of course I want to go, Mum. I had said, tears spilling down my cheeks. Stop snivelling like a real baby. Grow a pair, will you? I didn't bring you up to be a blubbering wreck. And for goodness sake, crying over a skirt. I've never seen anything more ridiculous in my entire life. You will do as I say, Olivia, and I will find you something decent to wear in your wardrobe, because clearly you have no clue what to dress in. That flimsy skirt of yours needs to be trashed. No daughter of mine is going to be seen dead wearing such trash. My mother brought out a long frock from my cupboard that she'd made for me herself that I'd never ever worn because it was so frumpy. Mum, I can't possibly wear that. It's ugly, it's horrible and it's so big. It'll make me look like a tent. It'll make you.
you look very attractive, love. It will accentuate your virtue, which is in very short supply at the moment, it would seem. It's got a decent hemline above the ankles, which is far more flattering than above the knees, I can assure you. And so much better than that god-awful skirt of yours. Where on earth you bought it, I cannot imagine. I had begrudgingly put on the horrible dress that reminded me of something the Amish would likely wear. It would need a bonnet to finish off the look. When I had seen my rather shabby reflection in the mirror, tears poured down my cheeks. I looked absolutely awful, but my mother smiled with a great satisfaction, especially when she saw the miserable look on my face. She seemed to thoroughly enjoy making me unhappy. "'What are you sniffling about, you ungrateful little brat? That dress looks perfectly lovely on you. Why are you complaining?' I'm still going to let you go to the party, aren't I? But I can't go looking like this. I look like a freak. Nobody dresses like this. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. They obviously have got absolutely no taste and no self-respect whatsoever. But no daughter of mine is going out looking like a hussy. And that is final. I had watched in horror as my mother brought out her dressmaking scissors and she cut up my short skirt into ribbons. I was lucky because my best friend Angie would surreptitiously give me some of her trendy clothes to change into when I arrived at the party, so that I didn't look like an ancient relic from the 18th century, which I was exceedingly grateful for thanks to her, because I did not want to be a freak at the parties I attended. So yes, you could say, I did have some less than agreeable memories of some less than pleasant times, spent here at Silver Lakes with my mother. But what my husband Lenny failed to fully appreciate was that my current distress was caused by someone who was stalking me and had absolutely nothing to do with my late mother. Lenny was the kind of man that did not suffer fools gladly. If he had an inkling of what was actually going on with me, he'd have probably gone after the stalker himself, with all guns blazing, and wouldn't have been adverse to beating them up into a pulp to get them to leave me at the hell alone, as Lenny would do absolutely anything for me, even if it meant breaking the law. I couldn't let Lenny get involved in my current dilemma, or take the law into his own hands, so the less he knew about what was currently going on with me, the better as far as I was concerned. And there were some secrets from my past he had no knowledge about at all, and I wanted to leave it that way. He was right, of course, I was indeed an emotional mess. I was losing a great deal of sleep at night and living on my nerves. I knew someone was following me around, but I had no way of knowing who it was. But I intended to find out at the first opportunity. I wanted to confront that person myself. I knew whoever they were, their primary focus was on me. They wanted me to see them. It was like they were feeding off my fear delighting in my discomfort that they were projecting towards me, along with the nasty notes they kept sending me in the postbox. I wondered if the stalker was trying to intimidate me, to get me to leave Silver Lakes, which was a distinct possibility. My mother had known a lot of people in this neighbourhood over the years, and when I left home she had only spat out vindictive spite against me, creating scandalous rumours about her own daughter that had spread around the neighbourhood like wildfire. My mother genuinely believed that I had the morals of an alley cat, and furthermore she wanted everybody else to know about it. I knew coming back here might have ruffled a few feathers among some of the long-time residents, who seemed to have memories equally as long. Many of these people that had lived here when my mother was alive had held her in high regard, not having any notion that behind the sweet charming veneer that she projected to the world lurked a very nasty woman indeed, who was probably spouting out venom against them behind their backs, without them being even aware of it. My mother could be syrupy sweet to anybody she met. People would not think she was capable of being nasty. But growing up I had heard my mother's catty ramblings about people in our neighbourhood that were less than kind. It was not uncommon for me to hear her bad-mouthing someone based on what they were wearing. My mother always judged people by their outer appearance, and if they wore anything she felt was too revealing, she'd always call them a harlot. 
I knew that because I had been called that name often enough, and it had never sat well with me. I had not been back to my childhood neighbourhood in many years. Much had changed, as it always does when you've been away from a place for a very long time. The most noticeable change for me, of course, was the trees that fringed our pavement, that over the years had grown into spectacular, towering and mighty specimens that were nothing short of impressive, and these trees fully shaded the street. Many of the attractive houses had been renovated. People seemed to take pride in the presentation of their front yards, more than ever before, with neat flower beds, pristine hedges and neatly manicured lawns. The neighbourhood was situated outside Spokane, Washington, and had a rural energy about it, boasting wood groves of trees and all kinds of intrepid trails for horses and mountain bikes alike. So if you were an adventure seeker who enjoyed embracing the great outdoors, it was pretty close to a perfect place to live, as you can get. Mrs. Parsmore, who lived next door to us when I was a little girl, had made her feelings about me very clear when I returned back to my old childhood home. She was one person I would have happily avoided like the plague, but I knew a confrontation with her would be inevitable. That woman had a mouth on her that would make a dirty potty look clean. Suffice to say I was heartily relieved that Mrs. Passmore's husband and son were no longer around, as they had been tragically killed in a car accident five years prior. I don't know if I would have returned to my home if that had not been the case. I hate to say this, but I had no empathy for their plight, based on what they had done to me all those years ago, when I was a teenager. I tried not to think of that inauspicious event that had so wantingly destroyed my life and robbed me of my reputation, which my mother had been hell-bent on destroying for me. She never had believed my account of what had happened that night, especially when I returned home wearing clothes my mother thought were suitable for only a prostitute to wear. On that evening I'd been wearing a sparkling silver skirt that Angie had lent me, with its hem above the knees and a black turtleneck sweater with a silver belt. In my haste to get away from the Passmore household as fast as I could, I had not changed back into my mother's homemade dress that I had stuffed into my bag and overlooked. In my desperate haste to escape the likes of Kev Passmore, who was about my age, along with his creepy father, I had rushed home wanting sympathy from my mother, but that was in short supply practically non-existent, for none came my way. I had so longed for her to take me lovingly into her arms and to tell me all was going to be all right, but instead she greeted me with contemptuous, dagger-like eyes filled with such hatred that were as sharp as thorns and as spiky as needles. "'What the hell happened to you tonight?' she asked me her eyes studying the clothes I was wearing in abject horror. Where is that decent dress I gave you to wear this evening? Why are you not wearing it? Where did you get that silver skirt from? You look dreadful. You look like a tart. The dress is in my bag. I changed into this, this skirt that Angie lent me. You borrowed clothes from Angie. Is that what you did? You were supposed to wear that dress I made for you. Why are you snivelling like a great big baby? What the hell is wrong with you tonight? Mum, I need to talk to you. Something really bad happened to me tonight. Really bad. I have to tell you what Kev Passmore did to me. Tears pulled down my cheeks as I began to sob. But my mother had no pity on me. If you've had any trouble from Kev Passmore, love, you brought this on your own self, said my mother. I warned you not to dress like a tart. If you dress like a hussy, you'll be treated like one. Look at you in that silver skirt. You look ridiculous, like something that should be hanging on a Christmas tree. I raised you to have self-respect, but you're letting it all hang out. You're an embarrassment to me, you really are. If Kev Passmore has paid you attention this evening, I can't say I'm remotely surprised. You brought this on yourself. Honestly, I raised you better than this, Olivia. Now off to bed at once. We'll talk about this matter in the morning. 
because right now I can't bear the sight of you. If you pull any more stunts like this, borrowing your friend's clothes again, you shan't be attending any more parties. I can assure you of that. Mum! Kev Passmore hurt me tonight! Mum! I blubbered. He attacked me! My mother rolled her eyes in the back of her head. For goodness sake, Olivia, go to bed, will you? As I told you, I cannot bear the sight of you. If Kev Passmore was paying you attention tonight, I keep telling you, you brought this on yourself. I told you to wear sensible, respectable clothes, but you wouldn't listen. So don't expect any sympathy from me. In the end, I knew there was no arguing with my mother. I soberly soaked in a hot bath, scrubbing myself so incredibly hard that I'm surprised I had any skin left on me at all when I finally did get out of the bath, when it was ice cold. My whole body was now stinging, burning from the pain. I wanted to get any trace of Kev Passmore off my body, but I had no way of knowing that shaking that young man off my life would not be so easy, as even all these years later he still haunted my nightmares like the Grim Reaper, even though he was now dead. I could still see his bloated red face as he forcefully pinned me down to the carpet in his parents' living room. His breath smelt strongly of alcohol. Let me go, Kev! I had cried. Please stop this, Kev! Don't do this! Please, I'm begging you! But a deep, guttural voice from the back of Kev's throat had emerged. His eyes had grown dark and hostile. It was so icy cold, the look he gave me. It would seem that Kev Passmore, who had always been a good friend of mine, had just dissipated, and I was staring into the eyes of a monster, a monster I did not know. So here I was, back at home, seventeen years later, with some less than savoury memories that still clung to me like the threads of silk from a spider web. I suspected Mrs. Passmore had seen the removal van parked outside my mother's old house. She had obviously grown curious. She had marched over to me indignantly, like a hornet that would like to get its thorny barbs into me. The indignant look on her face withheld any friendly overtures towards me. Mrs. Passmore had grown a lot older in the seventeen years I'd been away from Silver Lakes, but I suppose that that was to be expected as age doesn't do us any favours, and seventeen years can be a considerable long period of time. I had been renovating Silver Lakes over the last six months, and had fortunately not crossed paths with Mrs. Passmore, although I had noticed her curtains tweaking from her house, so I guess she'd been watching me for all this time. It was now that she had chosen to show herself to me, and this was not a reunion that I welcomed. I noticed her hair was no longer auburn, but was now as white as a lily. She was wearing it in a rather fetching, short-cropped hairstyle that suited her small face and long, heavily wrinkled neck. Her indignant brown eyes glared at me furiously through the crinkled folds of flesh. Her face reminded me of a tortoise as her eyes took up most of her face that had shriveled up and become rather small. She was wearing a modest pair of navy blue chinos, a stylish gold belt, and a crisp white cotton shirt, with a sensible matching pair of white pumps on her feet. Although she was thinner than I'd remembered her, but my mother had always said that she ate like a bird. That woman is a walking skeleton. She's always watching her weight. No flesh on her bones whatsoever. She looks dreadful, you know. She thinks she looks so attractive when the reverse is actually true. As Mrs. Passmore made her formidable approach towards me, my heart began to flutter in my chest. I drew in a deep breath. I felt as if I was bracing myself for the impact of her cruel words, which I knew would never, ever be kind. If looks could kill, she was wearing that look on her face, which I read as saying, What the hell are you doing here? Look what came crawling through the woodwork! said Mrs. Passmore sarcastically. She gave me a furious look. Fancy seeing you here, Olivia, after all these long years. How long has it been? she said. Ah, oh, I think it's about seventeen years, if I'm not mistaken. 
I can't say I'm surprised you're back again, like a big fat maggot crawling over a dead, decaying carcass. I knew once your mother was gone, you'd be back like an odiously bad smell that can never abate. Couldn't help yourself, could you, dear? I've seen you crawling over her house, Silver Lakes, within weeks of her death, as you were renovating it, weren't you? It's disgusting, that's what it is. I ignored Mrs. Passmore's brutal jabs. I knew that woman would never be nice to me. She had always despised me, probably because under the layers of her denial, she knew that her late son, Kev, when he was alive, had been a monster. But being his mother, she didn't have the guts to admit the truth to herself, as living in denial was so much easier. I gave her a watery, insincere smile. How are you doing, Mrs. Parsmore? It's been a long time. Not long enough, as far as I'm concerned, said Mrs. Parsmore. I was hoping that I'd never get to lay eyes on you again, Olivia. You brought so much shame on your poor mother. I said nothing, as Mrs. Parsmore turned around to look at the activity around the removal van, and could see my husband talking to one of the men in earnest. Is this what I think it is? She said, looking at the removal men, hauling in some furniture from our previous address, and calling out to me, Ma'am, do you want this couch in your living room? Yes, please, I said. Could you put it under the bay window overlooking the street? It'll be very nice in there. We'll do so, ma'am, said the man, throwing me a warm smile. I watched the two men hauling up the heavy white leather couch up the steps, huffing and puffing as they did so and they heaved it through the arched entranceway. It was quite a mission. I reluctantly returned my polite attention back to Mrs. Parsmore, who was still standing next to me, with an unamused scowl developing on her face. There was no doubt that she was not best pleased to see me again, especially because I was moving in next door to her. She'd probably thought I was renovating the place to sell up, but not to move in. I didn't care what she thought about it. I'd put the past behind me, and she would do well to do very much the same. I was not going to let the ghosts of the past haunt me again, especially since some of them were now dead. This was my late father's home, and I wanted to keep it in the family and pass it on one day to my own child. Kev Passmore and his father were long since dead. I need no longer live with the fear that those two men had inflicted on my life such a long time ago. Those old bruises had long since faded. Sorry, I said. What were you saying, Mrs. Parsmore? I got distracted by the removal men. I've got so much on my mind at the moment with the movers here, as you can see. It's been busy, busy, busy sorting this place out. But we're getting there slowly, and surely. I'm sure you can see the house has had a full makeover. I've thrown away all my mother's clutter. There was so much stuff. Mrs. Parsmore frowned. You should be ashamed of yourself, Olivia. I can't believe you're talking like this. What kind of a daughter are you? You never visited your mother once when she was dying of cancer. I can't say I'm remotely surprised by your attitude. Your poor mother spent her last days in Silver Lakes all on her own, you know. I made sure I visited her every single day. She really appreciated my visits. She was in a lot of pain, you know, so they administered her lots of morphine. Your mother refused to go to a hospital. She wanted to die at Silver Lakes on her own. She had two hospice nurses who took care of her full time. She told me she wrote to you, Olivia, but you never came to see her, did you? She wasn't surprised about that. She always said you were rotten to the very core. But now she's gone, you're crawling over everything she owned, aren't you? Like a big, fat, juicy maggot. You can't wait to get your greedy hands all over her assets, can you? It's so typical. Why on earth she left you her house and her money, God only knows. I tried to persuade her to leave it to the dog shelter, but she just wouldn't listen. You didn't deserve a thing after you brought so much shame on her, in the way you did. She never got over it, you know. Mrs. Passmore, if you don't mind my saying, your words are like thorny barbs. You well know 
There was no love lost between me and my mother. That is no secret, especially after what happened that night at your house, which was not my fault. I will admit she wrote to me, asking for me to get in contact with her. I didn't know she had cancer at the time. Had I known, I'd have come to see her. Despite everything, she was still my mother. I didn't get in touch as I didn't see the point. My mother decided a long time ago that I was a whore. Nothing I was ever going to say would ever change her mind about that. Your mother thought you were a whore because you were a whore, Olivia, and you probably still are. A leopard doesn't change its spots, does it? Look at the way you dressed back then. You left nothing to the imagination. I'm just glad you're a little bit more modest now. Maybe you've learned some invaluable lessons. In those days, you left everything hanging out. All your girlfriends were much the same. It was shameful, as your mother said. She was desperately embarrassed by your behavior. She had to get you to dress sensibly. Don't think she didn't know what you got up to when she wasn't looking. You'd leave her house wearing such a nice, sensible dress. And when you arrived at a party, you would change into something really slutty and immodest. My son Kev told me all about it. Don't forget he saw you. He was at the parties you went to as well. Everybody dressed like that back then, Mrs. Parsmal. It was the fashion, I'll have you know. My skirts were a lot longer than some of the other girls. I was a teenager, for goodness sake, trying to express myself and to fit in with my peers. Everyone dressed like that. So you should have called us all sluts in that case. I was more modest than most. If I'd worn the dress my mother insisted I wore, I'd have looked like a fish out of water at those parties. When you're a teenager, you want to fit in with your peers, don't you? It's normal behavior. The dresses my mother made me wear made me look like a nun at a convent. Tell yourself that as much as you like, Olivia. But you wanted to dress trashy, didn't you? Don't forget on the night my husband saw you. He saw everything. He told me what he saw. You were all over my son. You couldn't get your filthy paws off my Kev. The two of you were inebriated. You drank all of my husband's finest Scotch whiskey, and then you set about getting your promiscuous claws into my poor son. You defiled my boy, Olivia. Kev was a good boy, a very good boy, until you got your slutty little claws into him. We had to send him to a school far away from here because of what you did and your licentious reputation. I couldn't have you taking advantage of my son again. When I told your mother what my husband had seen that night, your mother was absolutely mortified. She wasn't surprised, of course. She always knew you were a slag. When I told her how you threw yourself at my son, Kev, her worst fears were confirmed about you. Was it any surprise your relationship with your mother fell apart? It combusted on its own. You brought this on yourself, Olivia, because of your wanton ways. I wonder if your husband knows what a hussy you were back then. If he did, he'd give you a wide berth, I'm most sure. No man wants to be married to a loose woman. Mrs. Passmore, your husband was lying. You know it, and I know it. Maybe he lied to protect your son. I'm sure that's what he did. He physically saw your son, Kev, raping me in the living room of your home, on that blue carpet in there. And he did nothing. He did nothing to stop it. I begged him to help me. I begged and begged. But he didn't do a thing. He just watched your son raping me. That was just the most awful thing. I was telling your son to stop. I didn't want him to touch me. We'd only ever been friends. I wasn't interested in him that way. We went to school together. He was a nice boy. But that night, he turned into a savage animal that I didn't recognize. It was like the devil came out of him that night. You can blame the drink as much as you like, Mrs. Passmore. But there was a dark side to Kev. And I think you know it. 
How dare you talk about Kev like that? My Kev was a good boy. You were the corrupt one. You came on to him, not the other way round. Mrs. Passmore, I said, raising a hand to silence her. When your son was finished with me, your husband tossed me out of your house as if I was a garbage bag, telling me to leave Kev alone and that I was nothing more than a dirty slag. But your son, your son, Mrs. Passmore, was the guilty party. What he did was wrong. He took advantage of me, Mrs. Passmore. I told him to stop. I said no, but he still wouldn't listen. You and my mother twisted everything to your own advantage. You wanted to believe the very worst about me, didn't you? You spread thick, ugly lies about me around this entire neighbourhood. And everybody believed your lies. It was disgusting what you did, Mrs. Passmore. But you did it to protect your son's reputation. You didn't want people to know what he was really like, did you? You didn't want them to know he had raped me. Lies, lies, lies. That's all that comes out of your mouth, Olivia, dear. I can see you haven't changed at all. You're still lying through your teeth. But then again, why change the habits of a lifetime? said Mrs. Passmore, her eyes growing round with rage. You forget, Olivia. My husband saw it all with his own eyes. He told me everything. I'm not going to stand here arguing about this with you, Mrs. Passmore. What's the point? You've made up your mind that I'm a liar, and that's the way you want to play it, and that's fine by me. I've got better things to do with my time than argue with you about the past. I've moved here to make a fresh start, and that's what I intend to do in my father's home. I'm not selling this place because the house has been in my father's family for generations. I intend to keep it that way. So I'm sorry, Mrs. Passmore, but I'm not going anywhere. Mrs. Passmore thrust a bony finger in my chest, glaring at me angrily. Lies! Lies! Nothing but lies! No wonder your mother couldn't stand the sight of you, Olivia. You brought shame to her, and this neighbourhood as well. That's exactly what you did. It's a pity neither my son or husband are around to defend themselves against your cruel character assassinations. If they hadn't been tragically killed in that accident, they'd be standing up for themselves right now, I'm most sure. Did you know it is evil to speak ill of the dead? Look, Mrs. Passmore, I heard about the car accident that killed your husband and son. I'm sorry for your loss. We're going to be neighbours now, whether you like it or not. I've decided to move into my childhood home, so let's at least agree to be civil with each other. Put the past behind us, shall we? Why do you have to move in here? That's what I don't understand, said Mrs. Passmore, growling furiously. Why did you have to come back and bring back so many nasty memories with you? Do you know what you are, Olivia? You're a bad omen. Everything is jinxed when you're around. You jinxed my son Kev and my husband, and now you're about to jinx me. I can feel it in my old bones. I watched Mrs. Passmore briskly turning around, marching defiantly back to her house. She turned around briefly and shouted after me, If you know what's good for you, girl, you'll get out of here and move back to Nova Scotia. Nobody wants you around here. You're like a stain on the landscape. Why don't you just go away and never ever come back again? Who are you talking to, love? asked my husband Lenny, walking over to me and watching Mrs. Passmore trotting back to her property and closing her front door behind her. Oh, that's the next door neighbour who was very good friends with my mother. She's not best pleased to see I've moved in next door to her, that's all. I don't like the look of her. She looks like an old bat. I don't like the thought of her being our next-door neighbour. I think I'd rather live next door to a ten-ton viper. Don't worry about her, Lenny. Her bark is worse than her bite, I assure you. On the evening of the storm, I'd promptly retired to bed, with my husband Lenny at my side crisply enfolded in the cool cotton Egyptian sheets. I was haunted by the thoughts of the ambiguous figure I'd seen in the afternoon that had been staring up at me in my bedroom while it bucketed down with rain. Luckily, by this time, the storm had long since abated. 
I lay restlessly in my bed, with insomnia being handed to me as the long insufferable drawn-out entertainment for the evening. Sleep had chosen to abandon me to-night. It would seem an unrepressed, spirited, nervous energy within me was gaining full control of my mind and building up like the water in a pressure cooker that reaches boiling point. As a consequence, I was almost having heart palpitations and hot flushes, like someone going through the menopause. This had to stop. I couldn't go on living like this any more. I needed to nip this in the bud at once. If I continued to live with fear leaching out the joy from my bones, then there was no point in living here at Silver Lakes. We might as well just move away and go straight back to Nova Scotia and be done with my childhood home. Maybe Mrs. Passmore was right. What was I thinking coming back here after all these years? It was probably a bad idea. All I was doing was dredging up some less than favourable memories from my past. I reluctantly climbed out of bed and trotted over to my window. I pulled back the curtain very cautiously and inwardly squirmed. I could see the figure again, standing there like a dusky silhouette against an inky sky. They were hell-bent on not leaving me alone. I knew in that moment, whoever they were, they hadn't noticed me staring outside the window. They were momentarily distracted and appeared to be speaking to someone on a cell phone at this late hour of the night. There was something about this person's movements that made me believe they were reasonably young. For a moment it had crossed my mind that Mrs. Passmore had been trying to scare me away from my home by stalking me. I wouldn't put anything past that manipulative, cunning woman. This solitary figure was too big to be Mrs. Passmore. This was my quintessential moment to get to the bottom of this enigmatic mystery. I needed to strike while the iron was hot. I had to find out who was stalking me. This time the stalker would be stalked. It was about time they had a taste of their own medicine. I would do everything in my power to ensure they had no knowledge I was on to them. Tonight I was going to get my answers, even if it killed me. My determination was resolute, my conviction unshakable. I tried to be as quiet as I possibly could. I discreetly got dressed, putting on a pair of black leggings, a hoodie, and a pair of sneakers. I made sure that my clothes were easily camouflaged, so hopefully I could blend into the darkness and become one with the shadows. I certainly could not afford to be seen by my stalker and blow my own cover. There was a night light on in the landing, and its soft gossamer glow enabled me to slip down the staircase as quietly as I could. The old staircase creaked and groaned a little under my footsteps. I was desperately afraid of waking Lenny up. At the best of times he could be a light sleeper. I trailed cautiously down the staircase. A claw grabbed my leggings, taking me off guard. I nearly let out an ear-piercing scream. It was Eartha making a play for my leg. That cat certainly picked an inopportune moment to decide when to play with me. She was always hanging around the staircase. I slipped past my cat, knowing that playing with her was the last thing on my mind right now. As any delay might well sabotage my chances of success in stalking my stalker. So there we are. That's the end of part two. Part three is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.